we are on the west coast of Mexico, at the edge of a tropical rainforest where man lives with few of the benefits of our technological age. Here in Ms. Malaya, primitive, sometimes savage nature still dictates the course of man's survival. For some, however, this virgin country offers a welcome invitation to danger and romance. picture company has come to Ms. Maloya. It will spend several months here in an attempt to bring authenticity and conviction to a fictional story of love and lust. It will also spend more than three million dollars in an attempt to guarantee the film's commercial success. This is the story of a motion picture company on location. The upheaval of their primitive way of life began six months ago with the arrival from the mainland of 250 laborers and 75 burros. Houston's commission was simple, the challenge spectacular. Within three months, the rainforest must be cleared and a mile of roads laid. Permanent housing and commissary facilities must be built to handle 110 members of the production. Electricity and hot water must be introduced to the area. And the major sets built of stone, brought in like all materials by barge and delivered by burro. The Herculean task was completed on schedule and without mishap. Hundreds of Mexican laborers had constructed a real practical world in which to live. Now, within that world, artists and technicians gathered from many countries must create a work of the imagination. American playwright Tennessee Williams is the author of this work, whose imagery Mexican cameraman Gabriel Figueroa is photographing. Basil Fenton Smith records the sounds and words of the story, played against the sets of art director Stephen Grimes. And the bilingual production manager Clarence Uris directs the overall mechanics of the production. Richard Burton portrays the film's central character, that of a defrocked minister adrift in Mexico. Ava Gardner plays the flamboyant owner of a tourist hotel on the outskirts of a resort town, while Deborah Carr assumes the role of a gentle, mysterious spinster. Sue Lyon, whose previous screen role was of the nymphette Lolita, is cast as a precocious American teenager. The backbone of the production is, of course, the crew, comprised of six Hollywood specialists, and 65 technicians from studios in Mexico City. The MGM Seven Arts production of Iguana 
will cost more than three million dollars, requiring a big but carefully drawn budget that producer Ray Stark must administer with Houston's cooperation. And, uh, back in New York, it's quite a different thing. They say, when is it going to blow up? When is the volcano going to explode? What's happening between Ava and Richard? What's Sue Lyon doing? I try to tell him it's like a Boy Scout picnic. As a matter of fact, you've called it right on the nose. We're uh, two days ahead of schedule on it. Not owing to my good officers uh, nearly so much as, as to the, uh, to the uh, crew, the Mexican crew. I've never known a crew to function better and more efficiently than, than this bunch of boys. But they're proud of themselves and they're proud of each other. And um, they're ready, John. Just about if they're ready for the next shot. So we're uh, going to. Directing a picture is rather like being at the director of an orchestra. You've uh, got to bring a number of components together. It's a process of, of synchronization and, and harmonizing. All the various elements must uh, finally combine into making the immediate scene at hand. And as you go to make each scene, the best rule that I know of for myself, for any other director, is that each scene as you go to make it should be the most important scene of the film. I've been asked how I direct, direct actors, tell them what to do. I direct as little as possible. These people are all creative talents. When I get to know an actor, this is the ideal. You can talk a kind of code to him, and he picks up instantly. You get on the same wavelength, and he knows what you mean. Could, my, could I not have my famous boy? Fantastic. Richard, Deborah, Lee. John, we're ready. Richard, Deborah, we're ready if you are. Silencio, por favor. Todo, silencio. Sound rolling. Hold it, hold it. Pide silencio, se va a tomar ya. Pide silencio, pide silencio, se va a tomar cambio. That should be something of an eye opener for you, Mr. Shannon. Fantastic. Yes, Mr. Shannon, fantastic is what it is. You were building your nest. And you didn't even know it. Goodbye. Let me, uh, let me drive you into town. No, thank you. I'd prefer to walk. What you could do for me, though, is have my luggage sent in after me. Oh, I almost forgot. I found this in the pocket of my smock this morning when I was packing. Uh, I, I, I want you to have it. Oh, I couldn't possibly accept, Mr. Shannon. Uh, take it, please. Uh, hog it. It'll pay your way back to the States. Uh, that's a real amethyst, so don't let the local loan shark give you less than 1,800 pesos for it. It's, uh, it's, its value has been established over the years. Very well, Mr. Shannon. I'll send the pawn ticket back to you so that you can redeem it. Miss Jokes. Um, I want to look at you. I, I want to remember your face in case I, I don't see you again. And I... I doubt that I shall. Cut. <laughs> All right. <Don't> <laughs> Una hora para comer, señores. Lunch one hour. Apaquen los generadores. Vámonos. Vámonos. Off the set as well as on, the Iguana is an unusual production. The company has even seen fit to provide cast and crew with an elaborate and well-stocked bar. 
three meals a day are served in the restaurant, with most foodstuffs flown into Puerto Vallarta from Mexico City and Guadalajara. The cuisine ranges from tacos to truffles, with the accent, however, on the spicier dishes. There are many ways to spend the leisure hour. A homesick crew eagerly attends mail call. 17-year-old Sue Lyon, despite her growing wealth and fame, is still studying for a high school diploma. She has made friends with the Ms. Maloyan Indians and undertaken to record their customs and problems as the topic of her senior thesis. Aboard the yacht Bonito, producer Ray Stark puts through business calls around yeah, the world yeah, I got you on, on the only I'm telephone within a hundred miles. Okay, uh, tell Elliot Hyman that the Armstrong's deal uh, is just fine. We'll meet all day Sunday in Westport with Granny and him and then set out uh, Monday for London if you'll make the reservations there. Right. Okay, uh, that's just fine. Uh, nothing else. No messages uh, from here. Over and out. Ava Gardner, apparently unperturbed by rumors of sighted sharks, has skied in these waters virtually every afternoon for the past three months. During this off hour, John Houston prepares to meet more of the complex challenges in the night of the iguana. He remains a calm, aloof figure, as befits the creator of this unique, if transitory, world. Efficient filmmaking in mountainous, sun-baked Bismaloya demands two special ingredients, improvisation and sweat. Tons of cable and equipment have been shuffled back and forth many times during the past ten weeks without complaint. The extraordinary Mexican crew has given Houston a degree of cooperation virtually unprecedented in the film world. Here, gaffers and cameramen, grips and electricians, sound men and prop men, all pitch in for the big move. You drop her. You drop her. You drop her. Now, Skip, pull back to throw one at, at um, Fidel. That's right. Now, now, all right, just a minute. That's right. Just a minute now. Maybe a left. No? No. Pull back to throw one at Fidel. All right. Now, honey, now, she does that. Just duck right underneath. Just run right underneath. You see? Directing is simply my work like painting is a painter's work, or writing a writer's work, or architecture, or science, or it's the thing I do. Sometimes there have been moments when, usually some years after my making a film, that I've sat back and, and looked at it with some pride. The reverse has also occurred. I've also experienced some shame. I think, I hope, as one hopes actually each time, one goes into a picture, starts making one, that this is the best, the one that's forthcoming. I don't think much beyond the picture that I am making. I hope that Night of the Iguana will be as good as any picture I ever made. I hope it will be a little, a little better. While a silent scene is being filmed on the beach, Burton redoes some previously recorded lines of dialogue to improve their sound quality. Okay. Hank, stop on the bridge. Yeah, on the bridge. Hank, stop on the bridge. Yeah, on the bridge. After each day's shooting, the exposed film is flown to Mexico City, processed and returned to editor Ralph Kemplin. Before leaving Ms. Maloya, he will have assembled the picture in its final form. Have you got that hat? Yes, Grandfather. All of it. Every... Every...
after a day's rest, the last of the night shooting gets underway. Actors report on the set at 5.30 and must plan on looking wide awake until 2.30 in the morning. The casual, the unsophisticated, motion picture-wise onlooker often says to me, my, what patience you have. And I'm always a little surprised at that remark. He sees people standing around, apparently waiting for the sun to come out or some climactic condition to change or until some mechanical thing is put right or he hears an actor faltering in line and do that two or three times and me say cut and start again. One paces oneself in making a film. It's a long race. It's a good two miles on the flat and you know when to move and when to, to lie back on the pace. It doesn't require patience, rather understanding. Once more, please. Uh, Minus the pencil. Minus the pencil. Throw the pencil away. No pencil. I know. It should be left there. It should be left. It was left there. Oh, I don't know. The sound reloading? One looks at rushes the same way a writer reads over his work of yesterday in order to proceed on to the, the work of today and tomorrow. You see your mistakes, you get clues, indications of good lines to pursue. I don't mean written lines, but I mean directions. You see something that an artist does that you could draw on, magnify, extend. You see your own mistakes. This is very important. With the idea of if they're serious enough, then you go back and, and remake the scene. I've made two or three such mistakes in this film, and I'll go back and make the scenes over. But in the frightened heart of me. Have you got that, Hannah? Yes, Grandfather. All of it. Every word. And it's finished? Yes. Finally finished. Yes, finally finished. Is it good? Beautiful, Grandfather. Oh, Grandfather, I'm so happy for you. Thank you for writing such a lovely poem. It was worth the long wait. Can you sleep a little now? I'd like to pray now. Filming of the Night of the Iguana is completed on schedule. Now ensues the traditional climax to a motion picture production, the cast party. From Puerto Vallarta come more than 200 friends of the company, while from the United States has come a choice spread of delicatessen specialties, flown in at no small cost to the producers.
last shot of the film has now been made. We're all about to go our separate ways home. There's inevitably a, a moment of sadness attached to this final moment of film. You've lived in a world, in a very private little society. If all has gone well, as they certainly have in this instance, why, there's some pain attached to the moment of, of separation. You'll never make this film again. All of you will never be together again. But when you've made as many as I have, why, you learn to accept this with some philosophy. After all the cutting and the editing and the dubbing and scoring has been done, and final release print is turned out, why, then I go on to the next picture. It's going to be Genesis, the first chapter of the Bible. Mm -hmm.